Hello, thank you all so much for coming. Oh my goodness. Uh, welcome to Inside the Video Game History Foundation Archives. Uh, my name is Phil Salvador. I am the library director at the Video Game History Foundation. Joining me is uh, our founder and co-director, Frank Cifaldi. Hi. Uh, I am a video game history librarian, which is a job that exists as of last February. <laughs> we uh, invented it. We invented it, yeah. Um, so actually, I have been coming to MAGFest for many years. Folks might know me from other panels. Uh, I actually met uh, Frank and our other co-director, Kelsey Lewin, at MAGFest. So uh, that kind of directly led to this, which uh, magical things happen here. It's pretty great. Um, so I figure what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing at the Video Game History Foundation for building a library. We're going to talk a little bit about, you know, kind of what's involved in this process and kind of the issues we're working through as we're starting to build this thing out. And then we're going to lo look at a bunch of just like cool old video game stuff that I think folks here will appreciate. Show and tell. Exactly. Yeah, we're going to do show and tell like the whole last half of the panel. Uh, so I should have brought this up earlier. Hi. <laughs> uh, so, we're the Video Game History Foundation. Um, if you were here at our panel on Thursday, you probably heard a little bit about what we do. Uh, Frank, you want to kind of introduce what the VGHF is and kind of what our mission is, what we've been doing to further that? And sure. Um, very good bullet points, Phil. Like, that really sums it up. But um, so essentially, we are a nonprofit uh, that is in service to video game history um, in terms of preserving its past and also making sure that people can tell its stories. And um, in terms of you know mostly what we're talking about today, the the, the notion of an archive, um, we're in service to storytellers, right? We want to make sure that people have access to what they need to actually tell the story of video games um, because uh, just depending on Wikipedia and stuff is not really getting you what you need. Um, so we're, we're building a collection of uh, primary material and, and cool stuff that'll help you, help you get the real dirt. Yeah. Uh, so we're, we do kind of a couple things at the foundation. Uh, we advocate for improving the field of video game history. We meet with folks in the industry and sort of, you know, help bridge the gap between these things and help move video game history forward as a field. Uh, we're also working with groups like the Software Preservation Network to uh, fix copyright law to make it easier to preserve video games. Uh, we could we're going to we're going to take down Disney. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just just us. Uh, <laughs> Disney lawyers, don't sue us. Um, <laughs> but that could be a whole separate panel. Um, we also do education. We come to events like MAGFest. We put on panels about video game history. We do pop-up museum exhibits. Uh, we have a podcast, the Video Game History Hour, where we bring in historians and just share stories from video game history. And then, yeah, we're building a video game history research library. And I think a lot of the time when I tell folks I'm a video game librarian, they think, like, oh, you, your organization must have, like, all the video games, right? Like I think people picture like a YouTuber's background where it's just like a wall of NES games. But the thing is, for the most part, we don't really collect video games at the foundation. And it's kind of for a couple reasons. One is that there's other folks already doing it and they're doing it, I think, better than we could. There's other museums, uh, there's private collectors maybe in this audience right now who already have like a complete run of NES games. So we don't, you know, given limited time and labor, we don't want to reproduce that effort. Um, and just between us and the panel, like, y'all know where to get ROMs, mm -hmm. right? Like, if you don't see me after the panel, I'll tell you. Okay. Uh, but point being, like, there, there's a lot of ways people deal with this. We're not naive about it. Like, we know people are accessing games other ways besides flying to Oakland, California for a week and, you know, spending 300 hours playing Persona. Like, we get it. So we're trying to think, what role can we play in this ecosystem? Like, what is the best use of our resources? And we like to say we collect context. We try to collect things that, again, help people tell the story of video games, whether it's academic researchers or even just like a content creator making a video who wants to add some additional you know, depth to what they're, they're uh, talking about. Uh, we don't think of ourselves as like a museum because you know, we don't have like exhibits in our office, but we think of ourselves as being a resource for people trying to tell video game history. Uh, which is where I come into the picture. Uh, so what do I do? I am a video game history librarian. What does that mean? Uh, so I'm coming to this from a background in academic libraries. Uh, I used to work at American University up the road uh, for 12 years uh, doing visual media collection management stuff. Uh, but I also, you know, I am a game historian as well. Uh, for the last decade, I've been writing about kind of unusual chapters in computer game history. Uh, if you remember a couple years back, there was an unsuccessful SimCity spinoff called Sim Refinery. That kind of broke out into the world. That was me. Um, 
So I had this kind of unusual skill set where I'm coming with like, you know, a master's degree in library science, but also the subject expertise in video games. Uh, so I'm able to bring, you know, how the formal, how libraries work side into a video game based organization. So you're a MAGFest gremlin and that was really important to us when yeah, we hired yeah, you? Yeah. Uh, I'm staying up till two in the morning. I, I was in the soapbox yesterday yelling about Final Fantasy VIII, so like, <laughs> yeah, like I get it. Um, so this leads us to how do you build a video game history library? Uh, we like to think that we are a library startup, essentially. We, I think we coined that term, too. Yeah, like, <laughs> that's not a thing that exists. Like, libraries have been around for hundreds of years, maybe older if you're in, like, Oxford or something like that. But the way I like to think about it is uh, the Video Game History Foundation is turning six this year, I think, right? Is, uh... I think this year might be seven, wow, actually. Wow, okay. Yeah. But yeah. either way, we're getting into, like, the, you know, kind of high single digits. Um, but for a long time, Frank and Kelsey have been collecting a bunch of stuff. Uh, you've been getting game magazines, prototypes, all books, all kind of materials. Uh, and we had a lot of stuff. We have an office and we have five storage units of stuff. Uh, I kind of see my role as turning stuff into like a resource people can use. Uh, Frank knows what stuff we have. Yeah, so I mean, you know, running this thing for a while by myself and then with Kelsey Lewin, um, who couldn't make it this year, unfortunately. Sorry if you were here to see her. Um, Basically, you know, I, I kind of knew there would be a fill one day, so uh, I did a lot of just collecting of material that, as an historian, I knew would build the backbone of a library. And, you know, honestly, Phil, you're just kind of here to clean up my six year mess at this point. The, the way I think about it is like I've been helping build out the library catalog, and like I think of it like I'm downloading Frank's brain. Like yeah. we went to storage a while ago, and there was a box that's just loose floppy disks, and it was like, what is this? Like, I don't know. Like, it was just like, I knew what that was. Okay, we, 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 we didn't know what was on them. We didn't know what the contents of this were, but you knew where it came from and why it might have been significant. Right, and it didn't write it down anywhere. Exactly, so it's my job to turn that into something that like people can access and use and look at. Um, and it was just a bunch of pirated Mac games or something, right? It was like nothing. Yeah, it was like yeah. pirated games. Uh, there was one disc labeled like not pornography or something. It was like, there was nothing of value in it. It was... <laughs> I didn't check. I didn't want to even put that into a computer. Um, but the point is, we want folks to access this stuff. Uh, we're building this library from the ground up, and I think a lot of traditional libraries are used to the model, like I mentioned earlier, where you go on site and you look at things. We want this to be as accessible as possible. Even, you know, we want to make as much of it digitally available as we can. Uh, but even then, we just want to make sure people know what we have. So if like someone has a weird specific request, we can at least see that we have something and they can look into it. Um, this has, of course, been challenging. It's been a whole process. Uh, we have been, again, setting up a library from scratch. Uh, the last year has been, like, setting up platforms and making them talk to each other and, like, vendor negotiations and very boring, unglamorous things like that to actually make the library function. Um, but a couple of challenges. First off is where do we even start prioritizing this stuff with all the storage units and things? So we've just been looking at like what makes sense to start on. So our focus has been on our magazine collection for a while because it's not low hanging fruit, but like it's all in the office and it's easier to catalog like, you know, all of GamePro than it is to try to figure out like here's this box of weird stuff someone gave us. Well, and you know, something I often say with, with the video game magazines, like I, I actually, you know, I, I don't want to get into the deep origins of the Video Game History Foundation on this panel, but um, I started collecting magazines as a frustrated historian way back in like like 20 years ago. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm that old. Um, and um, th part of the reason that we focus on magazines as as a as an ongoing you know thing for us is that while it's maybe not the best material in terms of blowing your mind and 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 uncovering history secrets, it is the most dense, right? Like if you pick up a magazine from any point in history, it's like, okay, you're getting some player perspective of what people kind of perceived games of their time like. You're getting marketing perspective with the ads. You're kind of getting context for what else is happening in the world of video games when another game comes out. It's just, um, it, it, it's a lot of uh, dense information in, in one place. And so we kind of want to knock out the idea of like, okay, let's just get as many of those in one place as we can um, so that, you know, even if nothing else survives, we at least have this, these, these dense tomes of information. And we are digitizing the ones that aren't yet available on the internet. I'm sure you know folks know you can go to the Internet Archive and get PDFs of a lot of magazines. We pay attention to what is and isn't available, and we're in the process of 
sending, if we have a duplicate copy, we can send it off to a scanner. They'll make a beautiful scan. Uh, we have done 1,100 magazines we've scanned so far. It's actually over 12 now. 1,200. <laughs> uh, do you want to see what that looks like? Look, yeah, at this that. Is <laughs> Look at all those. I think for most people, this is like the most video game magazines you'd ever see in one place. Uh, for us, it was Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, l let me be clear. So, you know, in, in collecting all these magazines, we get a lot of, you know, bulk lots of them in order to, you know, you know buy 50, get the two we need, and then we have four, 48 dupes, right? And, and what this exercise was, was I, I had, um, Phil, Phil hadn't moved across the country yet to work with us, and, but, and, and then we flew Kelsey in as well. And it's just like, okay, we're, it's, it's Operation D-Dupe, right? Like, like I took every box out of storage, I got every magazine on site, and it's like, let's just go through everything that's a duplicate, and then let's figure out what isn't scanned yet. And yeah, none of those were scanned on the internet yet. They all are now, actually. Yeah. Thank so you. And, and, and let's be clear, like we, you know, it was over a thousand, which, which I think, um, um, Retromag said it took them like 10 years or something. We did it in like three months. <laughs> uh, so we're digitizing what we can, but like, are we gonna do everything? Absolutely not. Um, digitizing takes like time, money, labor. It is, it is more work than you would expect, especially for something like a magazine. Uh, it is damaging to the original item, which is why we only do duplicates. Mm -hmm. You have to like debind and chop off part of the magazine to scan them. So like we only, we don't do it for like rare, fragile materials. We want to digitize what we can, but we realize it's, we're not going to be able to do it for everything in our collection, including some kind of three dimensional things we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but that's one of the issues. The other reason we are not quite digitizing everything yet is that copyright law is fun and good <laughs> um, and not extremely frustrating. Uh, we are trying to figure out how we're going to make this stuff available through a digital platform. We're talking with lawyers. We're working on this. It's just taking a while. Uh, the issue is just that like, you can you know, get a lot of things on the internet, but a lot of the time it's like, hey, where did you get that scan of Nintendo power? It's like, well, it fell off a truck. It's kind of the state of things right now. We want to have something that is more permanent that people can cite in their research that's going to, that we can have our own control over instead of just like something in a Google Drive folder that gets shut down because of community drama. Yeah, and, and uh, there might be a justification for pausing here to, to say that like, fell off a truck is video game preservation to us. You know what I mean? Like, like community efforts are real preservation to us. We, and we don't deny that at all. And uh, it's just that we don't feel entirely safe that, that uh, fell off a truck uh, digitizations are around forever when there are lawyers taking them off of the internet. So we're trying to, to build a safety net for that kind of material. We are a formal face that has a librarian on staff that's able to work these things out. Uh, which, yeah. Uh, so what's the plan for this? Uh, we're, building a we're building a physical library. We're building a digital library. We're hoping we can share more about this hopefully this year. We can start spinning some of this up. There's a little preview. I can't really tell what's in it. You'll get to that in a little bit. But um, it's taken a while. It's taking us a little bit of time. Again, just for all the reasons we mentioned, digitizing things, cataloging everything is taking a very long time to do, especially for just some of the weirder items we have. Uh, so we don't really have anything to share with you right now about, you know, what's going to happen with the library. But uh, you chose to spend your last night of MAGFest here instead of going to see Super Soul Brothers. So uh, <laughs> we want to give you a sneak peek into things. So uh, you want to see some cool shit? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Question. Uh, so let's go in. Uh, Welcome to the Video Game History Foundation Library. This is our office in uh, technically Emeryville, California, which Frank tells me nobody knows what that is. We're like two blocks from Oakland or Berkeley, and you're like, yeah, Emeryville. I, <laughs> Emeryville sounds good. It's where Maxis was based. It's cool. Oh, that's why. I never put that together. That's why you love it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, this is a little snapshot of our library. You can see some of the shelves of stuff. There's our Laura Croft statue from uh, IDOS' San Francisco office in the back there. Um, we got a lot of stuff on our shelves. Uh, just another quick close-up of one of the shelves. You see we've got magazines, we've got books, we have a whole bunch of stuff on here. Uh, we're going to run through what we got on these shelves, show you some of the weirder things uh, that I think people might not expect that we have. Uh, so let's start with magazines, which is kind of where we were, what we were talking about earlier. Um, 
As Frank mentioned, magazines are just pound for pound some of the densest video game history resources you can find. And we're trying to get, I think, as, as our focus has been on like English language, American primarily video game magazines. We do get international stuff as well, but it's just really a language barrier and shipping issue, frankly, for getting like things yeah. from the UK or Japan. Um, but I think we estimated we have something like 90 to 95 percent of American video game magazines at this point. Like it's a pretty substantial number. Uh, so if I said like video game magazine, first thing that comes to everyone's mind is like Nintendo Power, obviously. We have a complete run of Nintendo Power. Uh, this is what it looks like when you actually get the little shelf. Uh, thing. I, I want to point something out while you have this on screen. Um, something that we we noticed uh, by putting everything on a shelf is that every time someone tries to get cute and put a, a picture on the spine, they, they, they fuck it up. So <laughs> count Mario's eyes. <laughs> So I'm, I'm a fan of them doing like the really nice Lugia, and then there's like a Spider-Man issue right in the middle that just disrupts the whole thing. <laughs> but we have all of Nintendo Power, and then other big hitters like Game Pro. Like, yes, we have all of Game Pro Magazine. We have some of the big ones. We have. So because I took them from the Game Pro office, they're still in their poly bags, uh, just waiting for someone to actually need them. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a sealed set of Game Pro. Yeah. But we purposely try to cast a wide net beyond just the kind of stuff people know, and that goes up to the present day, but also really far back. Uh, Frank, you can talk about this example, about Video Magazine. This is one of the really early ones we have. Yeah, this is issue one of Video. Um, this was, you know, ostensibly a home video enthusiast magazine uh, from the, uh, what, 78, I believe, was that Yeah, issue? Winter 78. Winter yeah. 78. So that would be probably late uh, 77 was uh, when it was actually in production. Um, so... There weren't video game magazines yet. Um, there, there were two magazines basically covering console games. Just hilariously, it was video and games. Games is like a, <laughs> <laughs> like a it's like a crossword puzzle magazine. It's still around. I don't know. Does anyone know games? No one knows games. That's sad. Um, so yeah, this was you know we we collect these sort of pre quote unquote video game industry magazines that covered video games because it's it's such a rare thing to have any printed material talking about, uh, especially console games uh, from this time. There's, you know, computer magazines are kind of starting to, to, to come around, but, but, you know, this magazine in particular has reviews of every console of the time, you know, 80% of which are Pong clones. But it also has like VCRs and video recorders. Mm -hmm, like that's, mm -hmm. that's what it was covering, because that's what was on video. Um, so we try to get things from a broad range of history, and. There's also, like, I think a big part of our collection, too, is kind of console-specific magazines. People here might have subscribed to, like, PSM or official Xbox magazine, but there are also ones for less successful consoles. Uh, I'm a big fan of this unofficial Dreamcast magazine with this, like, really, really haunting <laughs> Sonic the Hedgehog here. Um, I'm going to have to scroll back through to get to the next slide. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, this was, I think it ran for four issues. But, like, Ziff Davis, what else did they do? Like, they were doing a bunch of magazines like oh, this. Oh, at this time? Oh, my God, yeah. Well, I mean, EGM was their big one, but they, they were doing official PlayStation. They were, um, I don't even remember what else they were doing at this time. But, yeah, but, but, but just a snapshot of kind of, like, what else was happening. There, like, there was an attempt at a Dreamcast magazine. It just kind of didn't go anywhere because the Dreamcast kind of didn't go anywhere. So just interesting kind of dead ends. Um, gotta get through this real quick. Uh, <laughs> another one, this is a really good one. Uh, folks here are familiar with the CDI, right? The CDI game console with classic games like Hotel Mario and uh, the Zelda Wand of Gamelon and Burn Cycle and all that. There was a CDI magazine. Uh, it was just called CDI. Uh, yeah, Burn Cycle, the ultimate CDI game. But it's... There's a question mark. Yeah, the, Add the question the mark. CDI game? Thank you. Question mark. Uh, but, so it's interesting because it covers the games, but like the CDI was like an interactive computer thing too. So there's also an issue on like how to connect to the internet through your CDI. Like it has this broad, they reviewed movies in this magazine the same way you'd review like DVDs or Blu-rays. It's fascinating. Uh, it's just a really interesting other perspective on kind of what else was happening in the you know, interactive entertainment industry at this time. Uh, another really good niche one that I love because it's a totally different perspective because these are all still like magazines for people playing games. This is PC Pilot Magazine. This is a magazine about flight simulators written by and for the aviation industry. So this issue here is talking about Microsoft Flight Simulator. They're, they're all talking about Microsoft Flight Simulator. <laughs> Let's be clear. There Every were issue. Other sims at some point, but like in this issue, they interview like pilots and are like, "Do you think Flight Simulator is a game, or do you think it's a simulation?" There's like this very big community schism that I know nothing about, but I think is totally fascinating. 
Um, I didn't know that. I'm really excited about <laughs> reading these flight nerds arguing about <laughs> Is it a game? <laughs> but, like, that's just the other, like, games mean things to people besides just, like, folks who go to MAGFest. So it's really neat to get some of that perspective. And this is current, by the way. This is still, if you, if you guys want to subscribe, you, you can subscribe to PC Pilot right now. Amazing. Um, and that just also, thinking about different audiences and stuff, this is another one I'm really glad we were able to do. Um, there was, I think this was like in the mid-2000s, Nintendo licensed a magazine called Girl Gamer. And this was a magazine... Well, okay, don't laugh yet. Like, this actually is a little cooler than you think. So, like, this was a magazine. It was a Nintendo advertisement magazine the same way Nintendo Power was, but it was targeted towards girls playing games. So there were columns about, like, you know, girl power in games or, like, which of these characters is cutest or whatever. But, like, this publisher, Future Publishing, that did it, they also published, I think, some of the most, like, sexist, offensive magazines, game magazines in the 2000s. The fact that they were now buying into, like, yes, there's this broader market for, like, people of other genders for video games. And, like, that's really neat. The fact that this did exist and this was, like, a promotional thing between both of them. That's well, and this was a pack-in with a, a women's magazine. I don't know which one. Really? But, okay. Yeah. I did not oh, know you that. didn't know that. Sorry. Know. That's going to the catalog. <laughs> yeah, we better catalog that, baby. Before we get hit by a truck, <laughs> I have to download all of Frank's brain information. <laughs> But no, it's, it's really unique, and so we, we have eight issues of it. We have them scanned. They are on the Internet Archive. I did see, is it... They're, we, th they're... we thought we were done, and then someone found issue 11, <laughs> <laughs> which, which has the Kinect on the cover, so it's no longer a Nintendo thing. They just went their own way after Nintendo bailed on it, I guess, but uh, this happens all the time. We'll get, like, you know, we think it's the last issue. It's, like, volume 5, issue 2, and then we'll get, like, volume 7, issue 3. It's, like... <laughs> We just, it, there's no way to know when you're done with some of these things. Some of these really short run magazines, there was like a 3DO magazine that lasted for like three issues or something. Um, but okay, so that's like... The official or the unofficial, because there's both. That's true. There were, there's 3DO <laughs> Club, that went for a couple more. Um, but this is stuff you can buy in the newsstand, and we have things that never went to the public. Uh, this one I really love. We have a bunch of issues of Lucasfilm's internal newsletter. Um, this is an issue of Lucasfilm's Monthly Marquee, and it covered everything. It wasn't just, uh, you know, like video games. It was also covering, like, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Uh, here's their game coverage from this issue where it says, Ron Gilbert's working on a game called Mutiny on Monkey Island. Rumor has it it's a comic romp and a swashbuckling pirate. <laughs> comic game. romp. This was, like, the first internal mention of this thing, right? Yeah, so, yeah. like, this is the very early mention of Monkey Island in Lucasfilm's newsletter. Uh, and you also get an insight into company culture, which I think is something that's really missing from a lot of uh, video game history. I love this one. This is an article about uh, the Halloween party at Lucasfilm in uh, 1990. And you can see here the winner of the most original costume contest was this guy named uh, Tim Schaefer. Uh, <laughs> seen here dressed up as a chicken nugget. Uh, <laughs> I hope he's doing well. I hope he landed on his feet. I hope he's doing okay. It's also, it's really good context reading this too, because it, again, it's all Lucasfilm. It's the Star Wars company, right? It's in, it's Industrial Light and Magic and stuff like that. Like the the games group is just the weird cousin that they have to invite to the party. You know, is is clearly the the tone, and uh, I have confirmed that with people who work at Lucasfilm. Games, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we also have here a different kind of publications met internally. Uh, this is a trade daily from CES in 1991. Frank, what is a trade daily? Can you explain this concept? Oh, sure. Um, I think this concept still exists even. So when you go to a trade show like an E3 or its predecessor-ish uh, consumer electronics show, which I think is happening right now, actually, um, there, there were piles of these like dailies with like the news from the previous day that you could get. Um, mostly that's, that's on the internet now, but I think they might still print some of these. Yeah, uh, so this was from a trade daily that was, this issue was covering games. Uh, so they had some coverage of Squaresoft coming off of their recent success of Final Fantasy I. Uh, there is an ad in this magazine for their upcoming releases of Final Fantasy II and III, which did not come out in the U.S. Is this the only source of the box art for Final Fantasy III that didn't happen? Uh, no, actually, they had, a, they had okay. a flyer at the trade show. They gave oh, okay, it either well. way. But, but either way, this is... But that, that show was like the, we're doing Final Fantasy II show. Um, and I think the... The cartridge ROM that's on the internet, you're welcome, um, was, was actually from the show. It was, a, it was a demo. Okay, but just a glimpse into what these companies were doing before I think there was the sort of scrutiny we expect on companies like Square. Uh, this issue also marked the debut of their very short-lived motto, uh, Square, smart, hot, dependable, and here to stay. <laughs> uh, you can use that one in your own bios if you want. 
Uh, but there were magazines like this. There were trade magazines for the video game industry that weren't meant to, you know, be distributed to the public. So we have issues of games business, for instance. We have the full run of games business, we which do. I'm very proud of because it's, it's ridiculous. But like this was the game industry talking to itself. They weren't, you know, like reviewing new games coming out. They were like, this is an article about lawsuits around emulation and like what companies were getting involved. They were covering like corporate management, which is, you know, you wouldn't get that in Nintendo Power. Um, this is my favorite, I think this is my favorite thing in the entire collection, this oh, yeah. issue of games <laughs> business. So this came out right after, I think it was like 99 when they, uh, when Sony showed off the PlayStation 2 for the first time, did their big demo with the Emotion Engine and all that. And they asked Miyamoto for comment, Shigeru Miyamoto, and I gotta quote this. He says, this is his response to the PS2 demo. He says, you can never completely trust what hardware manufacturers say. You should maybe believe only a tenth of what those manufacturers say. <laughs> so this is Miyamoto just dunking on Sony in this magazine. Like, he's not gonna say that to like Electronic Gaming Monthly, but in the internal game industry publication, like, yeah, like maybe that would show up there. Um, in terms of other industry stuff, uh, this isn't magazines, but I didn't really know where to put this. It's just a lot of fun. Wait, I want, I want to save this photo with the caption for like, next time. <laughs> For like n when Nintendo launches their next platform or something, just <laughs> <laughs> and like that smile of his with that quote is so good. <laughs> You'll be able to play Game Boy games in your 3DS. Oh. Yeah, maybe, maybe a low shot, but uh, anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt. RIP Virtual Console. Um, but anyway, so this isn't magazines, but we also have a collection of flyers for arcade games, actually. Uh, when companies were, you know, selling arcade games to arcade managers, they would, there was a flyer advertising it, or for like at a trade show. Uh, so this is the flyer for Burger Time uh, back in the day. Uh, has Midway cooked up a hot one for you? Uh, just giant burger. Just an example of the kind of flyers that are being distributed. Um, I also love this one. We picked this up at a show in California. This is, uh, these were just like, Playmeter was a magazine for the amusement industry, right? For folks operating yep. arcades, things like that. These were just like little cards that were distributed to people who subscribe. And it was like ads for arcade insurance or uh, upcoming conventions or, you know, products to buy. And there was this one I love. This is an ad for a game called the Ninja Gun. Guns are back, <laughs> bigger than ever. The Ninja Gun. I... I legitimately, I want, I want to scan this and turn it into a T-shirt. I just don't know if anyone's gonna go after. Who, us. Does anyone with the photo? The right to Ninja Gun. <laughs> I would wear this. Um, I, I want to talk about Playmeter magazine for a second because it's, it's, it's actually the coin-op industry magazine. So you know, the cover of one might be Street Fighter Two, and the cover of the next issue might be cigarettes, it's like the cigarette <laughs> machine issue. Fascinating. Um, but we also try to collect perspective outside the industry, too, about why games mm. were culturally significant, why they mattered to people. Uh, I love this example. This is a personal favorite for reasons we've already touched on this panel. Uh, this was an issue of Newsweek from 1989. Doesn't seem very game-related, uh, but this issue contained what I think we believe is Newsweek's first video game review. It was for a game that just came out called SimCity. <laughs> this was the first mainstream press coverage of SimCity, and it was in, like, a news magazine, right? It wasn't in like some computer thing. This wasn't a thing that like people in Washington were reading. Um, the folks who make SimCity believe that this issue is like the direct cause of everything that then happened with like Maxis and The Sims and all that. And it's because there was that external interest in something like this besides just the game industry talking to itself. You know, other examples of stuff like this, um, we have a few like um, mad magazines with video game covers like the Mario Brothers, because I just think that, that um, parody is, is a really great way of illustrating uh, uh, cultural significance, right? Um, we have... Uh, um, oh, we have like, uh, we have a few like Archie comics that have like arcade games on the cover for, for sort of similar reasons. Um, cause again, it's all context and that to me, that's cultural context to show like, no, it's not just nerds talking about this stuff. It has penetrated the world and here is proof. Yeah. Or like the, we have a USA Today covering the phenomenon of Pokemon coming out. Yeah. Like that's, that's more significant, I think, than, uh, than Nintendo Power talking about its own game. Yeah. Uh, so that was, we covered a lot of magazines. We're going to jump over to another medium, books. Uh, we're going to spend, not going to spend too much time on books because y'all know what books are. Um, but just as an example, like, <laughs> that was a really, bro why, I'm a librarian, why did I say that? <laughs> you know what books are, we're going to move on. Um, 
But it's, we, we try to collect anything that really is about or around video games. So just for two very contrasting examples, we have a collection of strategy guides, and we also have a collection of like game novelizations, for instance. Like we have both these things. Books is a very broad category. Um, going to another one, just because I took a bunch of pictures of books kind of next to each other to cover a bunch at once, we have books about video game history. Uh, this is actually an autobiography of Ed Smith, who worked on an early video game console. Uh, we think we're the only library with a video game autobiography section, is that correct? I hope so, yeah. <laughs> I really, yeah, I want to invent that too. Well, to me, like, that, that, that's kind of a half joke, but to me that, that's a sign of success when we have like a healthy shelf that's video game autobiographies because something that we talk about all the time when we're talking about why we exist is that we think it's weird how few books there are just about video games. Like if you go to Barnes and Noble right now, you know, there's like three shelves for like film and, and, and music full of things like autobiographies and critical theory and complete discographies and stuff like that. And you go to the game section and it's like two shelves maybe. And it's like art books, strategy guides, and like maybe a copy of Console Wars. And that's, that's it. And like that to me, that's really weird. And, and we're trying to fix that. That's kind of one of our goals. Yeah. Uh, and then other things exist alongside that as well. Like in the middle, this is an academic book about gender and video games and how they're played and perceived. We do have a lot of academic texts as well. Uh, and on the right, this is a really cool one that I love. This is an art book uh, about a box art designer named Hakwa Yo who designed a really, some really extravagant video game boxes in the 90s. Um, there's, I think this book was only 100 issues were printed, and I think between all the employees of the foundation, <laughs> we owned three of them. Is 3% critical mass? Is I, that? I <laughs> Do we have the critical mass on this book? <laughs> but point being, we have a wide array of things that you would consider books kind of existing alongside each other. We also have, I think not a lot of folks are doing this, we have things about the game community. These are both books about video game collecting. These are like collector's guides for video games and arcade games. Like we, you know, the, before there were, you know, discords for this kind of thing, people were publishing books about it. And yeah, that, we think that's significant, like how the community was interacting with these games over time. Did you know that's my first published work? I did not. Isn't that cute? I added, I added the NES section of that edition of the <laughs> Digital Press Collector's Guide. I did not know that. Um, and we, so we, we, again, with, same with magazines, we try to get things in that scope. This one I think is fascinating. Um, we did not buy the Nintendo PlayStation. I'm sorry to say we didn't <laughs> drop however many figures on the t Nintendo PlayStation, but we It was only six. Only six figures, okay. Um, but we did get the auction catalog when it went up for auction, because this seems like a significant thing, right? The fact that there was a rare game console that sold for six figures at an auction house. We think having that context kind of tells the story of what that is, maybe better than having the thing itself depending on who you ask. Well, and, and you know, I, we have another, well, we have a few Heritage catalogs, but um, I grabbed uh, from, I think, Comic-Con or something, the first Heritage catalog that had a video game on the cover, because that just felt like a cultural shift to me. And, and, you know, I'm sure we're all aware of, like, the high-end game collecting market and how crazy it is now. And so we, I like that we have an artifact of that, of that, like, shift of this traditional, like, comic and art auction company putting... I don't remember which Nintendo game on the cover, but like that, that, that's a cool object to have to sort of contextualize that. Uh, so that's all for books. Uh, we're gonna move on to a fun one. This is one of the things we can't digitize. That is objects. Uh, I didn't know a better way to put this, but we have a lot of physical objects like promotional items, interesting standees, things that were made for games. Uh, this is kind of our shelf of just misfit objects up here. <laughs> this, this isn't meant to be like, this is the collection. This is literally like, as I'm, as I'm moving into the new office, it's like a, a thing and I put it up there. So it, it's a lot of stuff. Uh, for a very good example, we have Duke Nukem's balls. Yeah. Uh, this was a promotional item for, was it a launch or a promo event for Duke Nukem Forever in Las in Vegas? In Vegas, yeah. Okay, yeah, but it's, you can see barely there's like a little like atomic symbol on them. But it's the kind of thing where it's like, yeah, this speaks volumes about how this was marketed. Like this, this can kind of stand in for what Duke Nukem is in the collection. Uh, don't know how we're going to make that available to researchers. <laughs> that, that's a white glove item, I think. But, uh, <laughs> We also have um, one of the collections we have that's really interesting is uh, when Telltale Games closed in San Francisco, uh, Frank and Co. showed up and took some. No, it's just me. There's no Co. <laughs> that was, okay. Just Frank showed up at the box. Store. I rented a van. I showed up. I said, gimme. Uh, but this was a really interesting one. Uh, this was an award they had at Telltale. Uh, if you can see, I'm going to zoom in. This was the, uh, the Ursa Major Award for Best Anthropomorphic Game of 2007 uh, for Best Depiction of Anthropomorphic Animals in Video Games. 
Salmon and Max season two won the award that year, uh, and now it's in our collection. And we don't really know what to do with it, but it's just really neat. Well, there was a whole shelf of their awards, and I was kind of out of space, and I was I couldn't grab all of them, but I grabbed that one. Uh, speaking of awards, um, <laughs> <laughs> wait, I, I want to tell the story real quick before you reveal yeah, it. Um, um, do I, do folks know about the Intellivision Amico and that whole thing that happened? Yeah. Okay, okay, Frank, take a seat. <laughs> so I got an email, and it's just subject line, do you want this stupid thing? No question mark. Uh, and then no, no text in the body and just uh, an attachment with a picture, and it was this. So in E3 2019, when it debuted, uh, everyone who submitted a game, I think, that was on the show floor, received the Intellivision Amico Excellence Award, <laughs> um, which is ours now. And... I think we decided at one point it would be funny to try to get all of them. Yeah, just collect every, <laughs> every Intellivision award, put them on a shelf. But yeah. again, in some cases where there's kind of intangible things like that, we can have an object that sort of represents that story. Uh, and I think this actually does a pretty decent job of, of that particular moment in its history. Well, we also, Kelsey Lewin um, went to enough game stops to finally get like the pre-order poster for the Amico as well. So we, uh, more we, thing, more we have the world's largest Amico collection. <laughs> Uh, and of course, got to mention this, we have the Bubsy Shrine. The filthy boy. <laughs> R.I.P. Bubsy. Um, yeah, we, there's, there's... Was anyone at his funeral last MAGFest? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so we, we, there's more besides this. Like, there's a giant, like, three-foot-tall standee of Bubsy in my office I don't know what to do with, <laughs> and I have to look at it every day. Um, that plush Bubsy, you said, comes from Jeff Gerstman, right? And it's filthy. <laughs> Uh, that's objects. We're still figuring out what we're doing with them. Uh, There's but, a uh, DirectX shark. There's a uh, Carmen San Diego teacher's guide. There's a house plan from Ikea. I don't know how that got there. <laughs> but a bunch of things. And again, we're still figuring out the process for how we're going to make these accessible to researchers, but we think they do have some research value in just seeing how things were marketed and understood and interpreted. Uh, moving to another type of object, uh, Game prototypes. People are always really interested in this one. Uh, I needed a good photo to uh, illustrate this, and Frank happened to be dumping a game while this was happening. So here's like a really exasperated Frank trying to make. That's a game. real photo. Wow, that's great. Yeah, that was that was you <laughs> trying to figure out the header for like a Super Nintendo ROM and just hitting your head. Oh, I remember. So yeah, this this is very frustrating. So I don't know if I told you what happened. So. You know, you can see these loose chips, one through four, with my very quick uh, 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 sticky note numbers on them. Um, that's not the game, but just imagine four chips like that. They were numbered one through four. Um, I couldn't figure out why it wasn't working. It's because one and two were mislabeled and they were flipped, and that took me forever to figure out. So much happens like that. Um, but yeah, we, we find and help dump and... Uh you know, video game prototypes. Uh, we often don't do it ourselves, uh, but we, you know, there are partners in the community, folks like Hidden Palace, who were able to, you know, make donations to and things like that. Um, we did have a really recent collection that's very exciting. If you want to explain the Ed Samrad collection, we can uh, do a sort of a jump scare of the picture. With <laughs> <that>. <laughs> sure, that's a good term for that. Uh, did anyone read Electronic Gaming Monthly in the 90s? Yeah. Um, so the editor in chief, Ed Semrat, he retired from games in like 97 or something when, when the magazine got sold to Ziff Davis and, um, hasn't really spoken much since then. He's just been like quietly retired, having, having a nice life. And, um, uh, he was very kind to invite me into his home and, and, and Kelsey and I showed up and spent about eight hours in his basement while he and his wife watched, just going through every box that he had just digging through all of his games because, you know, as the editor of EGM and before that a columnist who reviewed stuff, he was just sent games in the mail all the time. And, you know, the, his copy of Zelda that, that you could buy at, at a store or whatever, you know, is, is, is in bins, you know, in the same place that like a prototype or an unreleased game might be. They're just his games. So we went through and we sorted everything. Anything that was like expensive, we're like, hey, put this somewhere, Ed. And uh, we found a few prototypes. This is a handful. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, you know, these were, these were Ed's prototypes going back to when he started reviewing games in 82 through maybe like 93 when they stopped sending them to his house. He didn't really take stuff from the magazine, but, um, I think we found like three or four unreleased NES games that weren't online yet, which is crazy. Like one of a kind, you know what I mean? Like, like legitimately, I can't tell you about other copies of them. Uh, and a bunch of like unreleased Atari 5200 games and stuff that were already online, but like he had real ones so we could validate the data. Yeah. Um, oh, and this is a case just, you know, this is, these aren't in our collection. You know, he wanted to keep them, but 
um, we're a little bit flexible with collections like this in that we'll go on site, we'll digitize them, we'll kind of add them to our digital library, even though that's legally questionable. We're figuring that out. Um, we also have a, a very small amount of prototype hardware. Again, like the objects, we're still figuring out how to make this accessible. Uh, quick question, does anyone know what this is? Does anyone know what this goes to? Can you identify what console it goes with? Not, not Kevin, you. Uh, Green shirt. That's, That's correct. The Dreamcast zip drive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we don't know. Uh, we don't know what it was used for, what its intended purpose was. We still have to look into that. But this was a zip drive add-on for the Dreamcast. And in addition, we have the official Dreamcast orange zip disk. <laughs> Actually, we have two orange Dream <laughs> Dreamcast zip disks. Uh, there's nothing on them. We checked. We tried. Yeah. Um, but. Things to investigate, things to figure out how we're going to make available to researchers. Uh, we got a lot of stuff, so I got to start booking it through this oh, presentation. Okay, okay. Uh, source material. Really briefly here, we have a project called the Video Game Source Project where we're, to help, we're trying to move the conversation forward on access to video game source materials, which is code, raw graphics, things like that. Uh, that's kind of sensitive material in the game industry. It's sort of the secret sauce of video games. So we, we occasionally get these things, and to show that they can be used for research, we do write-ups on them sometimes and kind of show what sort of research you can do with access to video game source materials. Uh, for an example, does anyone remember Aladdin for Sega Genesis? Good game, right? Uh, so we have the source code to this game. Um, and like, you know, this is uh, something called uh, Tume? T-U-M-E? I'm not sure how to pronounce it. but There's it's all Tume in my head, but I don't Tume, know. Tume, okay. Well, it was the, the tile layout program used for the development of this game. So we can see exactly where various triggers were placed and how the level was assembled. We think getting access to this kind of source material is the best way to study games up close. Obviously, for something like, you know, Mario 64, the community's decompiled it, but like, Getting to the actual source code itself is a really incredible way to understand how a game was made and how it works. Well, and even if you decompiled the game, like if you decompiled Aladdin, you wouldn't know their level layout tool, right? So if you have their level layout tool and you're in there moving tiles around, you start to understand how the levels were built and you start to understand why certain decisions were made as you're playing the game. And, and you know, you can't get that without, uh, in this case, uh, an anonymous drop of source code that I shouldn't have. Yeah. Uh, another one we can talk about briefly, if you can explain this one, Frank. Sure. Uh, anyone know Earthbound? Um, so this was donated um, by Marcus Lindblom, who was the uh, localizer of, of, of Earthbound. Um, and this was the actual disc that he worked from uh, when he was localizing the game. So this, you can see there's an ape uh, engraving on the, on the disc, which is really cool. Ape was the developer in Japan. So they sent him the files on disk to directly edit. You know, it'd have the Japanese text and then he would write his version under it and then they'd compile it into the game. Uh, he deleted all those files years ago, unfortunately, but they were still there, we recovered them anyway. Uh, there's, so there's a big article on our website um, where I had uh, Tomato, if anyone's in the Earthbound community, you probably know Tomato. Uh, he went through and he's just like, here's all the cool stuff I found by having access to these files and here's the files. Thank you, community, we love y'all. Um, so for the rest of this presentation, I want to talk about the real juicy stuff. Uh, special collections. Uh, for a brief <laughs> That's beautiful. It is beautiful. We, should, <laughs> we can't frame a GIF, but... Um, so these donations you've seen before, they were kind of cobbled together from many sources. We get donations, we buy things on eBay, we get them from a lot of sources. Occasionally, we will get a donation from someone in the game industry that represents their career and their work. And we like to keep it together as a special collection. Um, as sort of, you know, this represents what this person did. So it's all behind the scenes stuff from the video game industry, which is real juicy for us. And I think for the rest of this presentation, everything up here, nobody's seen before, uh, which is really exciting. I mean, besides the people who made it, obviously, but... Um, so we have kind of three collections from different, uh, different angles of the game industry we want to show to you really quick. Uh, the first one is uh, Mickey Cunningham, who was, uh, and, you know, she was an artist in the game industry for many years, I think from like the 80s to what, early 2000s? Yeah, and, and I want to be clear, clear, she wasn't an artist, she was a package designer. Um, yep. So she, she, uh, she worked uh, freelance for companies like Activision in the 80s, going back to like 86, something like that. Yeah, and designing things like uh, some of the ancillary things that went with it, like posters for stuff. These are flat posters for electronic arts games, Road Rash and EA Sports. Well, what's kind of cool, these are the posters that would be like folded in eight pieces in, in your box, but like she had the flats of them, so that's kind of neat. Uh, and also things like, you know, if you went to a store and you went to go buy Madden, there would be like a standee of Madden in the store. 
I don't think we have a standee, but we have the instructions on how to assemble them, <laughs> which I think is actually really cool because it kind of shows the labor involved, that it's not just like, you know, you go to the store of Madden or whatever. It's like, no, it was the person made the box art. It was turned into a standee. It was sent to GameStop. Somebody had to assemble it. It really gives you a perspective into that whole process. Um, this is the jump scare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can talk about where this is from, she yeah. told me. Um, so this was an event for Madden 94, where um, Madden came and visited the EA campus, and I guess every employee came out to greet him wearing this mask. Uh, so I, I don't think that's been documented anywhere that that happened, but we have a piece of it. Um, and then the other, I think the really cool one from this collection. Uh, so you said... Oh. <laughs> Mickey worked, for, worked with Activision on stuff, yeah. and I think you, the story as you explained it was like there was just a closet of stuff that was getting thrown out. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, you know, if you know your game history, you know that Activision um, in the early 90s was sold to this Bobby Kotick guy, um, and because they were big trouble before that, and, and like a lot of stuff in the transition kind of got weird, and, and I think as part of that, um, the the art closet was, was basically being thrown in the trash, so... Uh, Mickey went in and she found a painting and she's like, oh, it kind of looks like Indiana Jones. Maybe my nephew will like this. And it's the uh, original box art for Pitfall on the, 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 the television. Yeah. <laughs> they were throwing that away. Can you believe that? Yeah. Another thing where we have to figure out, like, I don't know how we digitize that. Like, that's, I, we don't want to scan a painting. That seems like that would potentially damage it. Yeah, it's probably a photograph, yeah. yeah. Uh, also, really quick, we need your help on this one. Oh, um, yeah. Among the other things in the collection is this map. We have no idea what this goes to. Nobody has any. It is for some game. Very likely Activision late 80s. Uh, it's got like a little bruffish on here. Uh, we'll zoom in on it. There we go. <laughs> if anyone knows what this is, if you're watching this on YouTube right now because you couldn't make it a MAGFest this year, like, if you know what this is, please tell us. We have no idea. Uh, but anyway, uh, other collections. Uh, another really exciting one, if you can explain who this character is. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, Nob is uh, the localizer of most of the Pokemon games from like Gen 1 through 4, something like that. Um, but uh, before that, he was a reporter. And he was, um, again, Electronic Gaming Monthly. He was the foreign correspondent in Japan uh, for EGM and, and through most of the 90s. So um, he got a lot of, you know, press material from Japanese companies, which for us is, you know, really difficult to find because we're not in Japan. Uh, so, for instance, at that time, if you got screenshots, this was before, you know, digital distribution of stuff, they would come on a film slide like this. Uh, we believe this is, according to, uh, to Kevin over here, this is a screenshot of Power Instinct, I believe. I'll, I'll take your word for it on that one. Um, <laughs> There's a second confirmation. So we have Power Instinct fans tonight. But, but he has like an envelope of just like slides. And there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. This was just the first one I grabbed when I was frantically trying to take screenshots before leaving for MAGFest. Um, another cool one is there's something called ad slicks at the time, which was just like pre-sized logos you could like reproduce in your magazine in like a physical layout. So this was the ad slick for Final Fantasy VI. Um, it also had a very rarely used variant uh, just called Final Fant. <laughs> <laughs> Which I mean, that, that text at the top says something like, you know, English logo with character, but that doesn't really explain what the <laughs> fan part is. I don't understand what's going on there. Just all sorts of neat dist like distribution things. Like, uh, this was uh, a flyer for uh, Mischief Makers. I think this is actually on, like, metal or something like that. It's a really nice flyer. Um, the one that I'm really excited about, though, is uh, uh, Nob went to a bunch of the Tokyo game shows in sort of like 97, 98, which I think someone said that was like for Square, that was like the Chicago Bulls of video games. It was just like nothing but rippers. It was great. Uh, so this was the promotional like flyer, not flyers, like pamphlets they would give out advertising all their games with some really amazing promotional art. This is beautiful spread on Xenogears, for instance. Uh, it just kind of shows you how they were marketing it at the time. Uh, as a Final Fantasy VIII head, I really like this. This was a, a uh, section of just all the merchandise they were going to sell for Final Fantasy VIII, including the official Final Fantasy VIII lighter. <laughs> uh, I saw one on eBay. It was like 150 bucks. I don't care enough to buy that. Um, just interesting to see how they were marketing these games and how they were presenting them. Uh, some of them before they knew it was going to be a big deal. In this case, I think knowing it was going to be a big deal and just going for it. Um, and then the last collection, the really, this one I'm really excited about, is Mark Flipman. This guy here, Mark Flipman, uh, looking mildly disgusted at this entire room right now. Um, so Mark, <laughs> He's a very nice man. He's not disgusted at you, I promise. <laughs> 
Um, so Mark Flipman was, I think you said he is the, like, the consummate publisher-producer type person, right? Yeah, so Mark um, worked at a lot of publishers, not developers, right? So he was the person uh, at, uh, you know, Konami, for example, in, uh, when he was there, who was working with external developers um, on, on their projects. Um, and, he, and he bounced around mostly in the Chicago area, um, different publishers, so. He worked on a lot of, I think even if you don't know his name, he worked on a lot of games you might know, uh, a lot of the Marvel DC games from the sort of Sega Genesis era, NFL Blitz, MLB Slugfest, uh, Dragon Ball GT Transformation for Game Boy Advance, a lot of that stuff. The, the one that was like mostly his creatively was uh, Maximum Carnage, the Spider-Man game on 16-bit platforms, yeah. We got a lot of stuff on Maximum Carnage, it's really cool. Um, but you mentioned Konami, one of the companies he worked for. Um, so we have things from Konami of America, and I think a lot of folks, when you hear that, might be expecting some kind of like a cool prototype. What we have is the company memo explaining their smoking policy. <laughs> uh, you could take two five-minute smoke breaks uh, between 10 and 11, and 3 and 4, um, but we, this is just an insight into the culture of the company, I think. That's, again, that's often a missing piece of the picture. We're often looking at the end product and not so much about how the company was managed and run. So we have a lot of that kind of documentation. You know what's good about Mark is, I mean, he didn't save every fax, but he saved a folder that was just called Funny Faxes. So. <laughs> here's, a, here's another good one. Uh, apparently in August 1990, somebody set the Konami van on fire. <laughs> um, we have the other end of this story. We have the end of the investigation. It's less exciting than you would expect, but once the library is up and running, you can learn for yourself what happened with the Konami <laughs> Uh He also had a lot of video. Um, he had, uh, this is an example here. Uh, he went to E3 2000 and just walked around the show floor and just recorded everything. That is gold to do in a story. Yeah. Just pointing at all these booths. Uh, here is the Nintendo booth from uh, E3 2000. All this cool stuff all displayed. I think you'll see the banjo Kazuki statue just a second. They were showing off banjo to me at the time. It's a very cool move. Uh, there was also very aggressive marketing for um, Planet of the Apes video game. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> kind of, kind of photobombing us right now. Um, Why are you talking? I love this play out, but uh, one other thing for Mark Flippin that's really Back cool. There's a couple more things. Um, so, do we have wrestling fans here? So, okay, okay. Uh, wow, okay. that took a Hesitant, second. But okay, we got some people. <laughs> uh, specifically, people who were fans of like, uh, like late 80s, uh, early 90s, like going to next generation era wrestling. Um, so Mark Flipman produced a lot of those video games, like WWF Raw, Rage in the Cage, Royal Rumble, King of the Ring. And one thing he did was, uh, this was when like digitized audio was becoming a thing. So he just, they took him backstage to WWF events and just recorded a bunch of wrestlers just cutting promos to use in games. And we digitized those tapes and we had those promos. One tape was just five minutes of Macho Man Randy Savage just going nuts. Um, <laughs> including a rare outtake of Macho Man, if you want to hear this. Okay, so here's, okay. This, this is like a, a minute of Macho Man. Oh yeah, I'm the Macho Man, two-time World Wrestling Federation champion, and it's lonely at the top, but not for me, because I got the Macho Madness with me, yeah, together forever, dig it. He's going to keep going. Oh yeah, I'm the Macho Man, former Intercontinental Champion, former World Two... No, I'll start again. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm the Macho Man, former Intercontinental Champion, former two-time World Wrestling Federation Champion, and now I'm going to do the thing on you, proving once again that I'm the best that there is. Oh yeah. He's just, he's just going for it. He's just riffing. Oh yeah, it's the Macho Man. Everybody get ready to get down. It's party time because we're going to do the thing in the ring. Oh yeah, get ready. Dig it. It just goes on like that. It's great. Um, but the last one I wanted to leave you with that I think really speaks to the unique role we see ourselves playing in preservation. Um, a game that I think is not well loved, but is maybe known. Do folks here know Virtual Bart? Yes. Okay. Uh, so yeah, not, not a particularly beloved game, but it's interesting because uh, there was, you know, there is Virtual Bart everyone played. A while back, a pre-release version of Virtual Bart leaked out that has, you know, it wasn't us, like it just is on the internet. Um, there's a bunch of minor, like a huge number of minor changes, just little things like this one right here. Uh, the whole premise is it's like you go to a science fair and Bart gets strapped into this virtual reality machine. Uh, and originally it's this kind of like metal sci-fi helmet with goggles. Then it becomes this like weird bicycle helmet thing with a Commander on Keen. It. Yeah, like that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. It's not clear why they made these changes, but we have the memo between Acclaim and 20th Century Fox explaining why these changes were made. 
as far as we can tell, it was at the request of Matt Groening, uh, based on this description here saying, comments by Matt, level by level, point by point, and they break down every change that was made. And this one in particular, it said the title screen was redesigned, we modified the headgear configuration to appear more like a kid's science project. Oh, so that was probably actually done like at Gracie by the Simpsons people, like the character design. Okay, that's neat. Yeah, so like th that's that's the kind of the role we see this kind of contextual stuff playing. Like there is a prototype, there is a final version. We can help explain, hopefully, with the resources we're gathering for the library, how all these things fit together into a bigger picture. That's kind of where we see our role being for a lot of the you know research support stuff we're providing. Um, so this is just the start. We have a ton of stuff. This is just kind of scratching the surface of all the stuff. I haven't looked in the storage units yet. I still have to learn. <laughs> Like we, we, we toured them briefly to my horror, but like we, I still have to dig into them. Because Phil was just like, what's in this box? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> but it's really cool stuff. Uh, we want to get this into your hands. Uh, please stay tuned as we build out the library platform. Uh, we're working on it, but we are still accommodating researchers as we're going. Uh, if you're a content creator and you want to use materials, like reach out. If you know, we might not have what you need, but like we might have stuff handy. Um, so we can help with that. We've helped with like uh, no clip, uh, for instance, has done a uh, documentary about uh, Grand Theft Auto that we happen to have materials for. Um, yeah, reach out, but hopefully uh, in the foreseeable future at some point, we'll be able to get more of this into your hands and uh, open up the library. But uh, we have five minutes because we spent like way too much time on Macho Man. Uh, so <laughs> let's talk. Uh, any questions, please, we'll just do raise hands. We'll repeat the questions. Uh, you've had your hand raised for a while, so uh, yes, please. Any current thoughts on the recent wave of Duke Nukem leaks, like the 2001 Duke Nukem Forever leak? Uh, I, I have the PR answer for this. So the question is, um, any thoughts on the, the recent Duke Nukem leaks? And um, we're, we're thrilled as people who uh, want to encourage the study of, of, of source material uh, in the interest shown in source material uh, uh, by those leaks in terms of like the way they got online. Uh, no comment. Yeah. Uh, questions? Yes. Yes, go for it. Yeah. Uh, so, in terms of like promotional materials, right, there's a lot of stuff that was kind of ephemeral around like press events and different things that only do like anecdotes by press and podcasts and stuff. So, is that, is that just going to be how you, you know, think about those kinds of events? So you have, you know, rich, detailed conversations about those things, but that's as hard as Right. The question. The question was about how we preserve sort of ephemeral things like anecdotes mentioned on podcasts, or I think even like school ground, like rumors about video games might fall into that category. Uh, I think right now the solution we have is there are folks who are doing research on that and we collect the research they publish. I would love if we get to a point where we can like do our own oral histories and archive them. We're just not there from like a labor perspective yet. There's well, and, and that said, I mean, you were asking specifically about like press events, right? The, the, like, uh, and you know, sometimes we'll have documentation that these things happened. So now we know what to ask, right? So like we have an itinerary f um, from Nintendo to a, a games editor for a, uh, <laughs> when Link's Awakening was come out, they put a bunch of editors on a train and just like held them hostage for like three days, <laughs> like traveling across the country. And like, we have an editor's itinerary and stuff uh, to, to even know that happened. Or like, we, we have material about this horrible sounding event where um, uh, Nintendo made kids um, like bob for apples in a giant pool of honey for, 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 for Banjo-Kazooie or something like that. Like, <laughs> And, and it's like MAGFest 2024. <laughs> <laughs> so that's part of it too, is just like by collecting this contemporary material, we, we, we start even knowing what questions to ask, right? Like we, no one knew about those events, at least I didn't uh, until that. Uh, let's get someone in the back. Uh, you in the red. Yeah. Uh, do you guys reach out to uh, publishers or creators, particularly you mentioned the example of, we did another one called seven, the kind of involved in five. Do you reach out to people who are involved in those efforts? Right. So, so about magazines specifically, not not games, right? Yeah. So the the question was, do we reach out to um, um, publishers, former staff uh, of magazines, to try to figure out like what's missing, what what we have, what we don't? Um, yeah, we do. Um, in fact, you know, just through my time in the industry, like we just kind of know a lot of people who are the in, in the in publishing and. Um, it's, 
it, it's hit and miss whether people even remember this stuff, honestly. You know, it's like, well, I don't, I, I think we were around a little longer. I don't know. And no, I didn't keep anything is, is the most common answer. But we've, we, we've gotten things in our collection by finding the people who worked on them for sure. Uh, one more question we got time for. Uh, let's scan. Uh, you in the black. Yes. Oh, so the question was, have we collected oral history? Have we conducted our own, our own interviews? Um, we haven't. It's definitely not for lack of interest. Um, it's just a lack of resources right now. There's really only three of us working on the foundation. Um, but we do have a lot of just audio recordings that are historical. Like, I was just telling someone last night, because I forgot, because we haven't cataloged it yet. We have recordings uh, from the Game Developers Conference going back to 1992, which is kind of, I didn't even know it went that far. Um, so we, we, we do have material like that, but in terms of collecting oral history, it's, it's something that I think a, a future version of us will start sort of, you know, like maybe funding projects like that as opposed to doing it ourselves. Yeah, in terms of conducting our own, I think in the research we do, like when we get interesting prototypes, we'll reach out to people. Uh, I just wrote an article about, uh, we have a prototype of Simcopter 64, and so like we reach out to former Maxis people, and that's not the same thing as an oral history, but like that's kind of the ad hoc scale we're working at right now. Like in the future in which we have $10 billion in funding, maybe not even that much, but like that, that is something <laughs> that we wouldn't like. Uh, it is just at the scale we're at right now, we can't really get there. Anyone have 10 million in this room? Oh, he raised his hand back there, come on. <laughs> <laughs> It is 10 o'clock, that's time for us. Uh, thank you all so much for coming here. Uh, we'll be here yeah. talking. Yeah, I don't think either of us have plans right now, so come hang out and ask Please. questions if you got them. <laughs>